Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, High Performance HMIs Done Right, co-hosted by ISA and Maverick Technologies. My name is Stacey Logan. I'm with ISA and will be hosting today's webinar. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items and let you know how you can participate in today's session. First, in regards to the Q&A session, we will have one at the end of today's webinar. To submit your questions, simply type them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. If you're viewing along with others at your site, please designate a scribe to submit your group's questions. Do not use the chat toolbox for your questions for the Q&A session. If you have miscellaneous questions for me, the host, submit those into the chat toolbox. Unfortunately, with a large amount of pre-registrants, we cannot open the phone lines for questions. All questions need to be submitted into the Q&A chat toolbox. If we don't get a chance to respond to your question, or if you would like to discuss a topic in more detail with the presenters, please feel free to contact, contact them directly. That information will be given at the end of the webinar. Second, for those of you who have just joined, please make sure that you are on mute. Both your computer and phone microphones should be muted. If you would like to see the phone and audio broadcast connection instructions again, please refer to the confirmation email I sent you, or if you go to the top left-hand side of your, of your WebEx screen, you will see a tab labeled Meeting Info. Some of the connection instructions are included there as well. Okay, I think that takes care of our housekeeping matters, so let's get started. I'd like to hand the presentation over to Chad. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, my name is Chad Harper. Uh, just a quick background, uh, I started my career as an APC engineer uh, doing advanced process control and then uh, as my uh, company was acquired by Maverick, uh, moved over and I'm now currently our uh, Director of Technology, um, which means I've got a, a uh, group of technology leaders for each of the major platforms uh, that report to me and we, we um, handle and, and uh, standardize uh, across platforms uh, within all of our projects nationwide. Um, we also have with us uh, Lee Swindler, and I'd like him to introduce himself. Yeah, uh, Lee Swindler with uh, Maverick. I'm a, a program manager here. Um, started out my career in the manufacturing side, um, working for uh, a number of different uh, chemical companies. Um, about five years ago, switched over to the engineering side, and I've uh, been with Maverick about two, year, two years now, uh, TUV Functional Safety uh, Certified Engineer, and also uh, have a, my project management professional license. Okay. Um, <clears throat> let me uh, kind of go over the agenda of what we'll be touching on today. Um, we want to start with uh, the basic concepts of high-performance HMI. Um, and get a little bit of history and, and uh, what we believe that is and what, uh, what things are going on out in the marketplace. Um, we want to talk a little bit about the benefits of implementing HMI, uh, high-performance HMI, and we've got some, some data for that as well. Um, you know, and, and one of the most important things I think we want to touch on is, is how to implement uh, high-performance HMI. There's a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of documentation, a lot of uh, stuff you can look at for for uh, guidance on one what is high performance HMI, but uh, but how that gets implemented and successful projects is is almost uh, just as important, if not more important, in in getting it uh, implemented successfully. So we want to spend some time on that as well. And then we'll have the uh, open Q and A session uh, as a uh, as Stacy mentioned before, through the uh, Q and A chat box. So, uh, to get started with uh, general HMI, uh, high performance HMI concepts, um, we want to kind of touch base uh, on a little bit of the history. Um, you know, what you see here uh, would have been kind of a typical graphic in the early 2000s. Um, it's a little fuzzy because it's a screenshot, but uh, you know, and and this actually, this particular graphic, uh, in and of itself, has some historical significance because, uh, as I move over here, that is the the graphic for the the unit that uh, had the explosion in BP Texas City in 2005. 
Um, the explosion was not directly related to the graphics, but uh, in the investigations that followed, um, they took a look at, at this particular graphic and uh, had a lot of issues that uh, created secondary problems uh, with that uh, explosion. Mainly, um, you know, it was the old style graphic. Everything's kind of thrown on here. Um, we're going to touch base on color. Um, and and uh, as you'll note here, you know, the things that stand out immediately to the eye are the, are the big red ratio control box, which is just a simple little uh, regulatory ratio control, which, you know, has no other significance other than it's red, but that tends to stick out really strongly. Um, there were no, you know, no trends, and actually on this particular graphic, there's no material balance. Uh, you can't actually see the flows that are coming into this column versus what's going out. Um, so you can't really, you know, even see it, you know, uh, visually what's going on with this uh, with this plant without surfing through several different screens. Um, and then even the navigation, the arrows that you see for, uh, na you know, to the sides for uh, lines coming in and out uh, weren't, uh, weren't good navigation targets. So even uh, getting around through all the displays um, took time and, and uh, caused some problems. So this really sparked the beginnings of, um, you know, what we, what we now have with the uh, Abnormal Situation Management Consortium um, and really a lot of thoughts about how we handle abnormal situations. And uh, the HMI is one part of it. Uh, alarm management is another part of it. Um, there's a lot of things that need to be addressed. But uh, this really kind of triggered a, a, a revised look at how we were displaying the units to the operator. So if we take a look, <laughs> you know, this particular graphic, uh, you know, it's clean, um, it's, it's well put together, uh, the data is in the right place, um, and would have been regarded as a pretty, pretty clean graphic uh, on, on an older system. Um, so we started thinking about, uh, you know, different things that uh, really affect our ability to catch abnormal situations. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about color a little bit, and this is a good example here. You, you look at this and you see uh, a lot of different things going on. Uh, process lines are different colors. Um, they're actually the same colors as the alarms, so that's an issue. Um, you see red and, and green pumps. Uh, so color and, and overall uh, presentability is an issue, even though this would have been regarded as a pretty clean graphic back in the day. So, you know, there are two alarms on this graphic, and you want to be able, on any HMI, to be able to immediately see your problems, and they don't stick out, as you can see on this graphic. They're actually right here, and they're just represented as those uh, uh, square, colored squares right next to the uh, indications. So, um, a lot to be desired as far as being able to identify problems quickly even though it was uh, well laid out and, and uh, the information is all there. <clears throat> so, you know, how do we really, how have we really evolved into that and, and where are we headed? Um, you know, as everyone's, you know, kind of aware, we, you know, the initial HMIs really uh, evolved from panel boards and so we saw, you know, the, the depiction of the unit pretty much uh, painted on the wall. Um, and what happened is as we uh, got into our, our DCS and PLC HMIs, we had what we'd consider the you know, CRT version of graphics. Uh, we had a lot of ability to put the P and IDs on, on a graphic, so to speak, um, and add everything we wanted to on there, um, but really not a lot of regard for color, not a lot of regard for presentation of information um, we were just happy to be able to get all the information on the screen. So um, there still had, you know, still improvements there. So what happened is as technology evolved, we as an industry wanted to evolve with it. So we move over to 
uh, more of a Windows world, uh, you know, uh, where we can get in and do uh, higher uh, resolution graphics, and we start seeing 3D, you know, 3D columns and um, smaller text sizes, more things crammed on a display, and you know, this particular graphic, you know, the one thing that stands out is the big flame on the on the on the uh, heater. Um, you know, that actual flame actually had a flicker to it as well, so it was even worse than what it looks like here. You know, the industry was kind of going down the direction of, hey, if we can draw it, that's good, let's get it on there. And so you see that um, even though uh, different color schemes and different capabilities uh, were possible, we're actually kind of heading in the wrong direction with this. I think the worst kind of examples were, you know, these type of examples where, um, you know, somebody with a big artistic nod, you know, wanted to get in and and do a 3D model of the plant or some sort of process unit. Uh, you know, this really is, uh, you know, terrible as an HMI because there's very little valuable information on here. So other than being a pretty picture you know, the operators really have very little to look at on this as far as how to run the unit. And so it's it's not a good, you know, HMI at all in order to be able to identify problems and, and operate the unit. So we took technology way too far as an industry, and, uh, and that was, you know, definitely a, an issue as we uh, kind of went through that evolution. So we started looking at uh, you know different things within abnormal situations, and you know the first thing, and I, th I think everybody's probably heard of this. First thing that stood out was well, it's it's color, it's you know the ability to to pull things, uh, you know, with your eyes and and find things immediately. And uh, I think what you'll find during our discussion today is that you know color is a very small part of all of what is, encompasses high performance HMI. Um, but it tends to get the most attention, um, and it tends to also get the most aggravation from operations and whatnot. So uh, we, we do want to address that and kind of talk about how that's evolved. So if you look here, um, you know, the first kind of vestiges of cleaning things up, you know, the, the 3D graphics are out, out, the towers are now simplified. Um, we still have some color issues with process lines or whatnot, but uh, overall things are getting better. Um, abnormal situations uh, and alarms tend to stick out a little bit more. So this was a, an evolution down the right path, but still had a lot to be desired. Um, but uh, this is at this point in the evolution, we were still focused on the color and really hadn't talked about or really uh, addressed things like navigation or uh, alarm grouping and things like that as well. So um, the focus on the color was here, but uh, we still had a lot of work to do. Just as another example, uh, things went you know kind of way overboard. This is an actual example of, of a, a, a standard from a, a pretty major uh, facility, and they, they kind of took the washed out to a whole new level. Um, and as you can see, there's, you know, as you can expect, there's some compl complaints from operations, and uh, really it was, you know, based on readability and being able to actually just see the data. So, you know, we talk about color and gray on gray and all those different things, but there, there's also a limits to that as well, and it needs to be uh, applied judiciously as well. So. You know what is really important. What makes something high performance HMI, and and what do we need to keep in mind as we go through that? You know, several key concepts. Um, you know, the first one is just how do you present information? Um, do you want to just have numbers on the screen? Do you want to present stuff so that your senior operators see exactly and they know exactly where to look? But if you have somebody new come on board. It's going to take them six months to identify where all the data is, or do you want to present things in a much more reasonable manner? And, and trending is one good way of doing that so that you can see the patterns. And so that's important. Um, you know, and then we get into color schemes and status depictions. Um, you know, this is a common 
issue that that uh, we run into with uh, pumps and and motors and and, and valves is uh, you know the the desire to make a something green versus red to indicate you know running or stopped or or open or closed. Um, there's many problems with this. First of all, green and red really should be reserved for alarm situations and, and indications not for process. So, you know, something that's more of a, of a shaded variety is, is much better. Um, the other issue is, you know, if you're in the power industry, they'll tell you right now that that red pump is on because it's energized, it's, it's dangerous, and the green pump is off. You go into the process industries, they'll tell you the exact opposite. So there's a really bad, uh, you know, kind of precedent set where we've got two different uh, versions of the standards across industries, and that causes a lot of confusion. And then, you know, thirdly, your know, color doesn't even need to be or have to be the only indication as well. So, you know, the the blue text here that has stopped and running is actually a very good way of, of providing even additional uh, feedback uh, to the operator on you know what that piece of equipment is doing. It doesn't take a lot more space and there's different ways you can you can set that according to your standards but uh, you know, having a combination of you know muted colors that aren't reserved for alarms as well as these uh, Textual indications is, is really the best way to go. So, you know, we're trying to get simple and uh, keep things simple. And so, you know, this is kind of a real simplified version of something, but, you know, we're, we're looking for non 3D graphics. We're looking for very, you know, clear interpretations of what's going on. Um, you know, the, the scaling for valve outputs is pretty confusing and doesn't you know, give a lot of resolution, so we prefer the the percents and things like that as well. So um, just a good indication of something that, that can be clean, and, and as you look at it, you know, you can tell exactly what's going on really quickly. And here's an indication of, uh, you know, of a, a running plant, and, uh, you know, it's still got the gray on gray, and, and it's uh, probably a little more muted than it would be live because uh, a lot of the indication or the uh, the arrows uh, and the navigation arrows look really washed out here, and they're a little better in in, in real life. But uh, <coughs> indicate anyway. In looking at a graphic like this, you can instantly take a look at things and tell you know that there is no major things going wrong with this unit. Um, there's nothing that's jumping out at you, and that's okay because this is actually running pretty well at the moment. Um, I'll flip over to kind of the version of this that shows you everything that could be in color. It's kind of like the uh, turning your key in your ignition and uh, having all the lights come on. You'll see that you know when alarms do come on, they're uh, indicated both by different colors, uh, different shapes, and uh, they're they're placed where they need to be, and uh, even more importantly is uh, those alarms are grouped so that, as you'll see on the navigation arrows to the sides of the graphics, um, you get a cumulative uh, check on what uh, alarms are going on uh, on related pages. And so what that allows you to do is is navigate quickly to the problem area and be able to see that immediately. Um, you can also have those type of alarm groupings in, in uh, menus and navigation uh, menus so that uh, you can come from an, a uh, plant overview and be able to go directly to where an alarm is um, based on. So this kind of gives you an example of if everything was an alarm, but you'll see even then uh, the color stands out well and it should be uh, very easy to tell what's going on. So, uh, well, let me let me go back real fast here while I'm here as well. A um, couple of other things that are important uh, are the navigation, of course. Um, you'll also see the H over on the, uh, I don't know if my cursor is going to be able to show, but um, you'll see this H block over here to the left side in the middle. Um, 
anywhere where there's you know complex control strategies, those are pop-up help menus that will uh, let the operator you know uh, interact and, and be able to tell what's going on with that particular strategy. So um, part of high performance HMI is, is getting the right information to the right person at the right time. So if they're having problems with that particular level strategy, uh, we want to be able to give them instant access to what's really going on in the in the details and, and any help that they might possibly need from the graphics themselves. So that's very important as well. Um, the other important item here is that um, you know everything that you see here is a is a standard library from you know from one of the vendors. Um, you know when when you talk about high performance HMI, um, there's a lot of activity in in that uh, in that area, and so you'll you'll have uh, different people, different organizations that will you know be uh, proposing different solutions. Um, we're proponents of staying with the uh, the original manufacturers uh, standard libraries as long as they fit the bill the reason being um, you know anytime you customize a library or buy a third party library um, you know you're going to be on the hook for ongoing licensing agreements and then every time you upgrade your DCS or PLC um, you're going to have to validate that library as a separate item and uh, what we found in industry is that becomes a, a very expensive and, and maintenance uh, heavy task to do that every time you upgrade uh, to a different release on your on your control system. So, um, you know, the standard libraries from the vendors are getting better and better uh, each each iteration, um, and by and large, they can handle a lot of things that they need to. Um, there's some things that do, you know leave some things to be desired, but every time you think about customizing and, and completely overhauling something, you really have to keep in mind um, the you know overall long-term cost of that and what it's going to take to maintain that and uh, validate all of those different shapes every time you, you upgrade your DCS or PLC. So just something to think about and, and uh, in the back of your mind and, and uh, and keep in mind as a part of your overall strategy on which direction you're going. Another important concept is the layering concept. So, you know, before we were pretty happy with, uh, you know, the P and ID is kind of thrown on a screen and every piece of equipment and every piece of instrumentation was on a screen someplace. And that was very important. And we were pretty happy with that. Um, what's really you know evolved here is the idea of a uh, multi-level hierarchy of displays and this really helps with navigation it helps the operators with being able to get to where they need to go fast and see the see the right things at the right time so really uh, a level one um, is typically uh, shown all the time it's not something you navigate from um, in many cases it's on a big screen you know above the operating console. Um, but, you know, and, and there's a lot of debate on what good level ones are. Um, they can be anything from a, a set of uh, trends for the entire plant. Um, they can be uh, more of a high level overview of the different unit operations with the alarms grouped um, together. Um, there's a lot of good solutions for this. There is no one right answer for what makes a good level one. Um, but it's important that you have that overall view of the process uh, somewhere. Yeah, the level twos are more detailed, um, and the level twos at the end of the day should be the ones that your operators are using uh, during normal conditions on a day-in, day-out basis. So if we've done our level twos correctly, um, the operators should be using those will walk into the control room. They should be on level twos unless there's some sort of problem. Um, if they're not on the level twos, then they're probably searching for something that should be on the level twos, and so you need to make an adjustment there. Um, but the key is, is to roll up different parts of the plant or mill and get them to where um, you can see larger portions of the operator's scope of control 
uh, without having to surf through a whole bunch of graphics. The third level is what we all kind of expect is historically is the uh, the graphics that we're, we're used to. Um, there's still a place for these. These are very important because they show all of the instrumentation and are very important in you know diagnosing and troubleshooting problems. So um, they're very important and in many cases um, if you already have a good set of graphics, um, it helps reduce the cost of the implementation because you can take what you have and base your level threes off of those. So um, really, there's a, these are very important, but we don't want to see the operators sitting and, and using these, you know, 90% of the time. We really want them up at the level twos. And then level fours are... Uh, diagnostic displays, help menus, um, you know, first out uh, pages, and also what is important is uh, uh, like startup shutdown or abnormal situation uh, uh, graphics. So uh, one thing that's very valuable is to be able to um, take a situation like starting up a, a, a tower, and if you have a a series of steps that need to be done to start up that tower, then uh, it's very helpful to put all of that into a startup graphic so that the operator can, uh, when he needs to, uh, get onto that graphic and start up the tower without having to surf through a whole bunch of graphics and follow a uh, you know, set of procedures on paper and, and uh, be trying to uh, navigate around everywhere he needs to go. So just kind of highlight the difference between a level two and a level three. Um, you know, here would be a depiction of a level two. <clears throat> it's you know one particular fractionation column. Um, it's pretty lightly loaded. Uh, not a lot of instrumentation on here, so there's room for more stuff. But you know, we made a concerted effort not to put everything on here because really everything you see on here is what the operator needs on a day-to-day -day basis. What's not shown are things like, uh, if you'll look at the bottom of the column, we have a reboiler uh, uh, set up here. There's a pretty complex strategy around those reboilers um, and the level control of the tower, but that's not something that the operator typically has to interact with. Uh, the control strategy is set up to be uh, so that the level control handles that automatically, and unless there's a problem specifically with that controller, he doesn't need to see all those details. So at a level two, uh, you know, we take that off of there because it's just too much clutter and too much stuff for him to worry about. This is really what he needs to operate the unit. You'll also see another example of a, a navigation tool uh, over on this uh, side exchanger. Um, you'll see the double arrows there. So anywhere where there's an exchanger that's got another medium on the side, whether it be hot oil or cooling water, um, you can have a target there so that you can go immediately to that system. So if you, that exchanger is causing you problems, you just you can hit the navigation button and go directly to that uh, cooling water system and see if you have a problem on that side. So you don't have to go hunt that down either. So there's quite a few things you can do with that. So if we look over to what the corresponding level three would be, um, you know, here's the bottom of that tower. Um, and you can see not only with the level control strategies, but there's quite a bit of other stuff going on, some temperature indications, a uh, lot of stuff going on with the bottom of this tower. So to put the entire tower with all of this information on there would make a very cluttered graphic, and uh, and it may not you know be able to be laid out well. Um, so the level threes are divided into a bot you know a top and a bottom portion. Um, so that you can get to details if you need to, but if I scroll back to the level two and I'm operating from this day in, day out, it's very clean and I can get to what I need to quickly. Um, so that's very important. So, you know, the important concepts are, are really, um, you know, what you've seen here isn't, isn't, what we've tried to convey is not this is what high performance is, this is what your standard needs to look like, 
what we've shown you is some examples. What's important to realize is uh, each each facility needs to have a standard that works for them. So um, your graphics may look like this, they may not, and that's okay as long as the fundamental principles are adhered to. Um, that's what's important. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, how you go about getting these developed and implemented is is just as important as the standard that you're setting. Um, so that's what we're going to start discussing as well, and that has to do with how do you get operations on board, um, how do you make sure these are maintainable and cost effective, and also how do you make sure that they're consistent across the board. And that's what uh, we want to discuss with uh, the next part of the, the program. Um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Lee Swindler. Um, we're going to talk about uh, a case study with some of the benefits, and then he'll get into the implementation as well. Thank you, Chad. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, go, go on to the benefits slide, please. Uh, this, uh, these benefits uh, uh, shown on here actually came from a, a study by Nova Chemicals uh, in partnership with the ASM Consortium. This was done back in the mid-2000s, and I got the opportunity to see them report out on this at a, uh, at a symposium. And I remember being just uh, very impressed at the methodology they used to conduct this study. Um, they did it in a very scientific fashion and, um, and how impressive the results were. At, at the time, you know, I really hadn't seen much in the way of uh, you know, sort of quantifiable results from using high performance graphics. And, I really felt like this study kind of hit it on the head. So uh, this was at a Nova Chemicals facility up in Alberta, Canada, and a, a very large plant with three ethylene units. And they had invested um, in developing a very sophisticated, uh, high fidelity operating training operator training simulators at this site. And, and it's with those operator training simulator platforms that they conducted this test. And what they did is they created a variety of scenarios that the operators had to troubleshoot and resolve. And they loaded those scenarios on a simulator that had the traditional graphics, and they loaded the scenarios on a simulator that had um, high performance HMI, and then ran the operators through these scenarios to actually see how they performed um, under using the, the different graphics. And that was really the only difference between one simulator and the other was the graphics that the operators were using to try to resolve the problem. So um, as far as uh, uh, being able to detect the, the abnormal situation before they actually got a, an alarm on the system. Um, with the traditional HMI, they were only able to do that about 10% of the time. With the high performance HMI, they were able to do that almost half the time through the kind of the proactive monitoring that the, that the uh, high performance HMI allowed. Um, as far as being able to handle the scenario and come to a successful resolution, uh, about 70% of the time they, they had success with the traditional HMI, but almost 100% of the time in resolving it with the high performance HMI. And then the time to resolve it. So, you know, how long did the operator take to, uh, to work through that abnormal situation? You can see with the traditional HMI, it was around 18 minutes down to 10 minutes with the high performance HMI. And, and so then they quantified, you know, assuming these, these upset scenarios were happening on their ethylene plant, um, you know, what, what sort of savings would you see? And at that point, it was $800,000 a year. And that's, again, this is back in early 2000s when the margins weren't anything like they are today. So um, a, a very impressive study and some very real results that came out of that. One thing not shown on this slide, too, is, is how consistent the operators resolved the problems with the high performance HMI, the, the spread between the best and the worst was very tight 
So the operators were all resolving them in about the same amount of time on the high performance HMI. With the traditional HMI, it was a much broader spread of data and it, it took the operators, uh, there was just a big difference uh, depending on which operator it was trying to resolve it. So um, some very impressive results and shows there are some real tangible benefits in implementing high performance HMI. So now we want to go on to how do you implement. So Chad talked about, you know, some of the science behind it, and, and, and it's good stuff, but it's, it's also fairly well known. that this, this, uh, The ASM consortium has been around since around 2000. The, this human factor science behind what makes a high-performance HMI has been out there for a while, and it's, it's fairly well publicized, so th there's no big secrets on the science side. Uh, but what Maverick has found is that the way you actually go about implementing the graphics is, is the most important thing to determine how successful those graphics are when you get done. So, so we're really about the process used to implement because we see that as really having the biggest effect on how effective the solution is when you're done. Um, and so that, that's, that's what I'm going to talk about here in, in my part of the session. Um, you know, one of the things Chad touched on is, is establishing that graphic standard before starting. You know, there's more than one way to do this right, but um, having that standard kind of gets everybody on the same page. It, uh, it, it allows for clearer understanding and communication to the operators, to the engineers, and to the people developing the graphics, so there's there's no you know uh, misunderstanding as far as what the final goal is with the graphics when you get done, and and, and also then th this helps you as as you try to maintain your graphics going forward. If you don't have a standard, uh, what we see is is the graphics fall into a state of disrepair over time because it's it's left to the person having to modify them or update them later to try to guess what was the original intent behind the high performance graphics that were developed. So uh, we're, we're strong advocates of creating a standard before you start. Um, a second factor that's, that's very important um, that, that I think is often overlooked is the facilitator used to kind of go through this graphics development process. And uh, th this is a person that runs the workshops that are done with the operators and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, um, but but this person needs to 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 have a kind of a unique skill set of of process knowledge, of knowing how to facilitate a meeting, and and also of being able to challenge the operators. So um, it, that that's a what we found is a very key individual as you work through this development process. Um, the fourth one there, operators needing to be involved early and often. Um, this is really critical. Uh, I've, I've seen high performance graphics implementations that have failed due to lack of operator buy-in, that, that they resulted in basically an operator revolt and uh, ended up going back to the uh, traditional graphics um, really through, you know, a lack of involving the operators, a lack of uh, getting them to understand what the concepts are behind it and, and getting their buy-in uh, before you try to um, force them to try to run their plant on these new graphics. So, um, and, and final, um, there you need, well, a challenge of status quo number five, um, you know, and that really comes, um, you can't necessarily be the operator's friend throughout this whole process. You need, you need to challenge the way they've been doing this in the past or you simply won't get the improvement that you can. This is kind of an optimization process here. And, and left to their own, the operators are going to gravitate towards what they're most comfortable with, and that is the traditional graphics. So um, there, there is a process here in, in getting them to understand what are the benefits 
and getting them to see how they can actually operate their unit more effectively by using high performance graphics instead. Um, and, and number six there is, you know, there, there's a testing and commissioning process that has to be gone through to also has an impact on the success of, of uh, these high performance HMI implementations. So um, the next slide I have is, uh, is the kind of a, a very high level look at the development process that, uh, that Maverick um, has found uh, to be effective when we implement high performance HMI. Um, as I mentioned, you know, it starts out with having that graphic standard established up front. And then um, just that sort of guides the whole process and, and gives a vision for what the end target is here. Once you have the graphic standard established, the first step is uh, what we call a storyboard workshop. And the output of that storyboard workshop is an optimized layout of the graphics and a navigation on how you uh, navigate between graphics. The storyboard workshop is led by this, uh, this trained facilitator that I mentioned earlier. And, and basically this involves um, sitting down in a room with several of the key operators and sort of guiding them through coming up with an optimal layout of the high performance HMI. And, and this sort of ignores what the traditional HMI was. You don't really care how many graphics the plant currently uses. This is coming up with, on a clean sheet of paper, sort of the optimal layout and the optimal number of graphics. And, and, uh, and, and having this trained facilitator do this kind of keeps, keeps people you know, guided and, and, and focused on the task at hand and, and sort of validates that the results are, are what, uh, what would be expected knowing what the underlying process is like. Once that storyboard has been developed, that identifies then the, the type of graphics and the number of graphics required. Um, and and um, out of that then, we begin the level two graphics development. You know, as Chad mentioned, those level two graphics are really key um, because those are the ones that you expect your operator to be running the plant with 90% of the time, you know, unless there's an upset or he needs to get additional information in a particular area, really the operator should run the plant exclusively from the level twos. And, and they also require optimization. So again, we involve a facilitator. Um, again, it's the operators and the engineers sitting down in a room and, and coming up with really the minimum amount of information that still allows that objective of the operator being able to run the plant using these graphics the vast majority of the time. So you need to get rid of any uh, extraneous or, or unnecessary information because if that's on those graphics, they're going to get too busy and too cluttered and the operator will not be able to proactively monitor his process in the way that you want him to. So again, we, we spend a lot of time on the level twos because, because they are such a critical graphic. Once the level twos are developed, then we move on to um, doing the level ones, any startup graphics that are required, and then the level three and the level four graphics. And what we found is by doing the level two graphics first, the level three and level four graphics almost kind of fall out. They're, they're, they're just a more detailed representation of kind of what you're trying to get at with the level two. So um, by doing the level twos first, these other graphics go a lot faster. Uh, the level one graphics and the startup graphics also require the facilitator to be involved because there is some optimization there. So the level one graphic, you're trying to select sort of the, the key parameters that are leading indicators to a problem developing in the plant. So again, you don't want to put everything on the level one. You just want to put 
the, the, the key parameters that the operators are going to get the most value out of in proactive monitoring. And then the startup graphics the same way. You're trying to optimize a, a special purpose graphic that the operator uses when trying to start up an area of the plant or a given piece of equipment. So again, you only want to put on the parameters that he needs to be concerned about as he's trying to start up a given a given piece of equipment. So, so at a high level, that is our graphics development process. This is what a storyboard looks like. So um, this is coming up with that optimal layout uh, in number of graphics for the plant. And across the top, you see the level two graphics in yellow. Um, so typically we see eight to 10 level two graphics for a, 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 a you know, typical major plant unit. And then below that are the associated level three and level four graphics that give the operator more detail underneath that level two. And what Maverick often experiences compared to a plant that has a set of graphics that they've been running on for 10, 15 years, we often see uh, even an excess of a 50% reduction in the number of graphics by, by instead, you know, coming up with this clean sheet approach and trying to identify the optimum number of graphics. So what, what we found out is, is we can actually implement high performance HMI for less cost than simply duplicating your existing set of graphics in a unit because of the amount of graphics reduction you get. So instead of redrawing and recreating graphics that are really unnecessary, we instead define what is the, the optimum minimal set of graphics and only develop those graphics. So um, this, this allowed, because of the reduction in the quantity of graphics, allows actually for a lower cost. So th this is my last slide. I'm talk a little bit about testing because that's, that's a pretty key uh, uh, part of the picture as well. So. Um, when it comes to testing new graphics, first of all, I will say that the picture part of the graphic is vetted and reviewed during the development process. So when you get to factory acceptance test or site acceptance test, that picture is already mature and, and there should be no changes really to the picture part of it. If there is, probably didn't do your, your job during the development of including the operators along the way. Um, the, the second important thing I'll mention is that, you know, the test system that you use um, needs to really duplicate the environment of the live system. And what I mean by that is the hardware and, and software versions. It, it has to be the same resolution monitors. It has to be the exact same point release of the DCS software that's being used on the system um, and, and, you know, the same stations, things like that. Um, there are clients that, that test on the live system, and that is certainly acceptable as well. But if it is a, a separate test system, it needs to have duplicate hardware and software that the live system does because there are aspects in the symbols, in the checkout that for instance, depending on what point release of software you're on, things behave differently and things work and don't work. So um, there's no guarantee unless your test system is identical that it'll work on the live system. Um, you should also perform, and, and, and Maverick has tools that allow us to do this, and, and some of the DCS suppliers also have tools but you should perform a database comparison between the legacy graphics and the new graphics to identify any discrepancies. And, and Maverick calls this our no code left behind process. So, so we look at all the points, for example, that exist in the legacy graphics, and we want to verify that, yes, all those points exist in the new high performance HMI that we've developed if there is a discrepancy between the two, 
you know, that's what you want to focus on and resolve. Why, why didn't this subset of points, why, why don't they show up on the new HMI and, and, and figure out the reason why? So, and then when it gets to final testing, um, you know, we, we advocate that, that that really should be done side by side with the legacy graphics. That way you can verify that readings match and that um, things are behaving the way they should and also allows you to revert to the old graphics if there's a problem with the new graphics. And it's just a good way to get the operators more comfortable with um, with this new th set of graphics that, that, that you're bringing upon them. So, and I will say by going through the, the, the work process we do, um, you know, we involve the operators in that storyboard workshop. We involve them in each step of the graphics development process. And, and what we see by explaining the concepts to them up front and having them involved in each step that operator buy-in really becomes a non-issue. They, they can see, you know, when you're developing those level two graphics, they can see how using those is gonna make their job easier. And they actually get excited about, man, how soon can we get this new set of graphics? Because cause they understand, you know, things are gonna be clear to them and they're gonna be able to do a better job operating their units. So, um, I guess with that, I'm going to wrap up what I've got and uh, turn it back over to Stacy. Thanks, Lee. Okay, we'd like to move on into the Q&A session of this webinar. We've already received some excellent questions, and I encourage each of you to join the discussion and submit your questions at any time using the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. And remember, if we miss your question, please feel free to contact the presenters directly using the information provided on this screen. Okay, our first question says, I have worked with end users who dictate multiple colors for piping, different for air, water, effluent, et cetera. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. I, I, um, <clears throat> I think I know what they're, they're getting at. The, the question really becomes, you know, what if, the the operations or the end user says well we definitely want colors for piping and whatnot and the answer is is that's okay um you know the even even the gray background and you know we we've seen shades of blue uh, all that's okay as long as you keep the main concepts in mind which is that alarms and abnormal situations need to stand out so if you're going to have process lines of different colors uh don't make them bright red or, you know, you've got to reserve colors and colors like those um, for your your abnormal situation. So you end up in the in the lighter, uh, call it the, you know, the, the pastel palette, um, but uh, you can you can end up with, uh, you know, lighter greens and things like that. Um, and, and as part of your standard, that's perfectly fine you know, as long as they still uphold to the general principles of if I look at that graphic, I can instantly tell where a problem is. And, you know, co you know different colors of lines is, is not necessarily a, a prop, you know, a contradictory to that, I guess. Okay. What you're describing as HP, HMI, is that simply doing proper HMI design? Uh, let's see. That's a that's pretty. I, I've had kind of a running joke that uh, five years from now, high performance HMI will just be called HMI, um, and I think there's some validity to that. I think we're seeing multiple industries coalesce around uh, these these standards, and so that's a, that's a very good thing. Um, and so uh, it'd be great if if you know five ten years from now. Uh, we don't have to call it high performance HMI because everyone's doing it. So I, I think there is some truth to that. So why hasn't this been done for the last 25 years? I, I, I'll take that one. You know, I, I think engineers, being engineers, um, don't always uh, pay enough attention to the people side of things. And traditionally, graphics have always been developed by engineers, and it it turns out there's a lot of human factors aspects to HMI that, you know, weren't intuitively obvious to the people developing them. So um, I think as it's 
there's been more of a focus on managing abnormal situations and recognizing them. And that sort of led people to discover that there's this whole human factor science realm out there and, and how to best that incorporate into the HMI. And, and so it has been an evolving process. And, and certainly you could argue, yeah, we should have got there sooner. But uh, we are where we are, and we reserve the right to get better. Okay. You mentioned the operator should control on the level two graphics, yet the example level two graphics did not show control elements, only PVs. Yeah, that's a, that's a good comment. Um, <clears throat> what we did for that particular project, and, and that's, that's definitely open for discussion, but um, for that particular project, the level twos, um, they wanted to see a smaller footprint for the controller, so they just wanted the PVs, and uh, you could click uh, on on any controller to get the faceplate to get access to outputs and set points. Um, that's not necessary. That just happened to be that particular client standard. Um, so you know, but what it does allow is for the level twos to be cleaner visually um, and uh, allow for less clutter. So there is a kind of a give and take there. Um, but I, I personally could see the, the benefit or the desire to have, even on the level two, see the, the full set point PV output. Um, but that's, that's definitely a conversation that needs to be had during the standards development. Okay, what supporting material would you consider to be the best guide on HP HMI information? Lee, do you want to address the the standards, you know, the ISA standards? Um, yeah, I'm actually, uh, you know, not that familiar with it. I, I've sort of, my background is more kind of the collection of material from ASM consortium and others that have been developed over time. And, and uh, so, um, you know, I, I guess I'm not familiar with the current ISA standard on it. Okay, I'll, I'll touch. Um, there's a good bit of reference material. Um, I, you know, uh, one of the one of the reference guides that I think is widely used, and I, I would uh, you know suggest it if you haven't looked at it, is a is a book by Bill Holyfield called uh, the Handbook of High Performance HMI. Um, a lot of these concepts are in there. Um, ISA has a committee that is working on uh, ISA standards in this area. I'll tell you they're a ways away from coming up with, you know, I think they're they're getting their first uh, iterations of some guidelines out uh, early next year, um, but I, you you shouldn't expect from from that a a series of standard shape libraries or or uh, specifics like that. I think it's going to be more general standards of things that we've discussed today, um, and uh, you know more direction for the uh, vendor companies on how they can adjust their libraries to, to kind of uh, meet, meet up with industry standards, but you're not going to see from ISA, you know, a bunch of libraries that say, this is how we all should do it, here it is. So there's going to be a lot, of, uh, a lot of customization, and that's a good thing because I, I don't think anyone in any plant wants to have ISA dictating exactly how their screens look like. That's that's really up to you guys. Okay. Um, how much more time does it take to develop HP HMI versus traditional HMI? This attendee is concerned about budget. Yeah, so, um, you know, there is, there is some upfront activities here, right? So we're advocating developing a graphic standard if that doesn't exist. Um, that can be done fairly quickly. Um, you know, Maverick has, for example, um, standards that we've developed for several clients, so we can guide people through that pretty quickly. Um, then there's this storyboarding activity. Storyboarding is typically a one-day activity, but with the uh, kind of the background, um, you know, getting up to speed, learning the, the particulars of the given plant, in, in unit and then documenting the results, you're talking about a week, let's say, for storyboarding. And then with the level two development, there is there is some additional time and meetings to go through that. Um, 
However, as I mentioned, because you're actually, uh, by going through this process, you actually have a significant reduction in the number of graphics, um, these upfront activities are more than paid for by the reduction in quantity of graphics required. Okay. What would be the average number of level two graphics for an average size processing unit refinery? Yeah, so what we're seeing in, uh, in refinery process units, it, around eight to 10, maybe plus or minus one from that. So um, doesn't really even seem to matter how, how large the unit is, you know, because refinery units vary in size a lot. Um, it, it seems like, you know, by the time you get seven to 10 or so graphics, as level two, you don't want to get much more than that because then the operator, you know, that's more than he can proactively monitor, at, you know, up in front of him at any given time. So um, the eight to 10 seems like we're falling in almost all the time. And that would be for one, that would be for one operator's scope of control. So I think that translates to other industries kind of similarly, you know, based on how many operators you have actively you know, at the console, um, if you have two operators, then each one of them would have, you know, a batch of uh, between six to eight level twos based on their scope of control is a typical number. Okay, we just have time for two last questions here. Have you been successful at getting sites to change their existing graphic standards given the changes required and the overall upfront cost of doing more work in the design phase? I'll, I'll, uh, Lee may have a comment here, but I, I will have, uh, I do have a comment here in that um, yet the, the answer is yes, and the, the more important answer is uh, this is, you know, at this point, this is the time to do it. And the reason I say that is we've seen uh, sites that went ahead and did a, a small portion of their uh, DCS migration or, you know, graphics upgrades and they did a small, let's say, the utilities area, and they didn't have high-performance uh, HMI as part of their standards, but they went ahead and did that small project anyway. And then when it came to the bigger part of the plant, um, everyone looked around and said, well, we, we started down that road. We can't go back. And so even if you're starting with that you know, very small kind of pilot you know, area in your plant, you're setting all the precedents for later on. So... Um, it is a lot more painful to go back and readjust halfway through and, and does include increase the cost. So I think the warning there would be, um, you know, as early as you can in the process to address those standards so that you can get that as the standard across the board. Yeah, the only other thing I'll add is, is you can have some flexibility here. There, there is no one set way to do this right. So as long as you're not violating you know, the, the important parts of the science behind this, you can allow some color, for example. Certain plants have aspects of their graphics that the operators are just so used to that it doesn't make sense to try to change. So, you know, what we've done with some clients to make this more palatable is develop sort of a higher level corporate standard for them and then allow each site to have kind of their site-specific addenda where they can deviate from that corporate standard or or do things in addition to that corporate standard to customize it for their particular application at that plant. So it, it doesn't have to be rigid. There, there can be some flexibility. Okay, last question. What is your opinion of using motion and animation in graphics? For example, pumps running, tanks filling, products moving? Yeah, I think uh, that's that's uh, we're getting uh, pretty far away from that uh, because uh, it, it's just visually distracting. So the real question is, uh, does that motion or animation really impart any knowledge to the operator that he needs by showing it an animation versus showing pump on or something like that? So um, anything that's that's moving is going to be instantly visually distracting, which goes against the, you know, the abnormal situation kind of concepts. Um, so it would have to be a, a very specific case where 
uh, actually seeing the animation was the easiest way to communicate that part of the process and maybe in a manufacturing standpoint or something like that. But um, to just show a pump running with a you know impeller moving in there or uh, you know uh, things like that, that that's that's kind of superfluous to just being able to say, hey, the pump is on and put it on there. And then if there's an abnormal situation, then make that very clear for the operator that something's wrong, not that he just sees that the little impeller stopped in the graphic. Um, yeah, you, I think the question had tanks filling as well. I think that that's different in that you would see via a trend or a, a level bar indicator, you would see things moving there, and that's okay. Um, trends actually would be ideal for that, but just uh, animation uh, in general, I, I would avoid. Okay, great. Well, these have been some great questions, and I thank everyone for participating. If you missed any portion of this webinar, or if you would like to watch the recorded version, we will be emailing all registrants a link to the recording along with additional links for supporting information. So be on the lookout for an email from me in the next couple of days. Additionally, once you close out of this webinar, a screen should pop up on your browser for you to take a short survey for us. Please take a few minutes to let us know about your experience today so we can better improve our webinars. This concludes the High Performance HMI's Done Right webinar. Thank you all for attending. We hope you acquired useful information and hope to see you again in one of our future webinars. Have a great day, everyone.